Yeah, thank you, Rex. And I'm <clears throat> uh, very happy to be here, especially uh, we've seen many old friends, some of them from far away, uh, from America, some of them from Taiwan. And uh, uh, I've been to Korea uh, about uh, five times, and it's really interesting to see how the development had gone. Uh, first time I come here is 1990, and it was more primitive at that time. Now it's far more uh, developed. And uh, over the show was driving us, uh, my family around. It was very nice to see the old uh, culture in Korea, which in many ways is very similar to what China had in the old days. But many of things were probably disappeared, already disappeared in China. You can see in Korea, so it's very interesting to know. So today I'm going to talk about some of the works that I've uh, done myself, the, um, and also with many friends together. Uh, I want to talk about it because uh, uh, many of my students do not know what I have done. <laughs> they only know some part of it. So I thought uh, it should be interesting to say something and how I motivate myself in many of my research. So this is the first one uh, uh, time that I started to do research. I was in Temple Hall, which was in Berkeley. Uh, astronomer department was housing there, and the mathematics department in the first floor, in the first few floors. It's right next to um, the Kong, which is the physics department of Berkeley. Uh, so, the first thing that I did uh, was in the Christmas of 1969, after I arrived at Berkeley as a graduate student. So, three months after that, I started to read a paper by John Muno. Uh, that was a Christmas when nobody was around. I was the only one in, uh, in the library. So, in those days, there were not too many papers and not too many journals. So, I was able to read both journals. And then Muller wrote a paper talking about the curvature of the many manifold and fundamental group. Uh, these are two uh, concepts that I just learned uh, in the first three months. And I found that fascinating that Muller was able to join them, link them together, and uh, to know what topology of the manifold is linked with curvature. And Individually, it's difficult to imagine they are related, but uh, they are related in a nice manner. So I was very much excited by this uh, statement that uh, Jeff uh, did. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. Um, uh, topology is very basic, of course, and the metric is defined on the on the topology. And uh, but three of the geometry usually say it a little bit differently. And uh, I generalized what uh, Muller was doing uh, is something called uh, Pleisman spear. And I think it's a um, reasonable, uh, straightforward, but still interesting to me up to, uh, up to 50 years. I wrote the paper up on this uh, fundamental group of a compact manifold with non positive curvature. It's interesting in a small, Silos uh, room in the uh, Berkeley Math Department. Other feature was a, uh, I think, a postdoc. Uh, he has long hair in those days. Everybody was involved in anti Vietnam War uh, uh, the protest, and they like to uh, smoke marijuana, and they, they, they have long hair and all that. So Arthur uh, insists to read my paper. I was kind of shy because I was. This was the first paper I wrote, and I'm not sure how good it is. But he was uh, basically just took my paper and, 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 and take it away and read it himself. And then he was very happy and commented that anything related geometry with topology should be important for physics. Uh, he told me that. Uh, I, I guess he was student of John Wheeler, so that was kind of uh, the, the concept that uh, Wheeler's group had. So although he may not remember this one at all, but this statement kind of uh, stick to my head for a long, long time, that 
uh, anything relating geometry with topology and expressive curvature should be important for physics. So, uh, well, with this in mind, I start to think about uh, um, what geometry and what uh, topology and all that would do. And I thought geometry, topology, and physics has been a unified subject to me uh, ever since. And of course, being a geometer, I always consider geometry will be the driving force behind these unified subjects. And this is partly based on my ignorance of physics at the time, and also relative ignorance and uh, ignorance of topology. Uh, but uh, it's fine because geometry is important. It's foundation on the boat. Uh, turns out to be in any case. Uh, well, but geometry, of course, is a beautiful subject by itself, and. Uh, it's uh, difficult uh, for me not to look into geometry in its very important inner structure, the building block of uh, uh, space. And uh, I always, when I was uh, in, in college, I was always uh, excited by the concept of curvature. So I feel the key to understand geometry is the concept of curvature. And it's supposed to be a building bridge, important bridge between geometry and physics. And this I did not know until, well, I feel that is the case, but I did not know it until I start to learn general relativity, where the concept of rigid curvature is seen to be equivalent to a distribution of matter in space time. This is Einstein's equation. When I looked at Einstein's equation, I was rather uh, excited uh, because of this statement that Richard Curry comes in and it describes the distributed matter. And uh, so, a uh, very interesting fact is that I read, look at it uh, in my heart. I said, okay, uh, they are related, but what happens if there's no matter whatsoever? Uh, do we still have Richard Curry and all that? So this becomes a very interesting question to me all the way until now. Space time where there's no matter, but rigid curvature is equal to zero, and whether the space time is trivial or not. Well, this is part of the reason I was interested in Calabi conjecture later. And, uh, but this is a statement I was excited about. Uh, so, I suddenly realized that uh, before I, uh, I gave the Calabi conjecture, I felt uh, that in order to understand geometric structures, the most important thing is that uh, we understand how to construct the geometric stru structure from scratch instead of just dictate by some equation. Now, this is easy to say. At the time when I was studying geometry, I think most geometers do not think in that way. They look at a given geometric structure and try to derive consequence of it. And this including great names, uh, uh, geometers. But I was also a student of Morley besides uh, Chen. And Morley studied nonlinear dependent equation. And the important thing is to construct uh, structures from nonlinear equation. So I decided this would be the thing to go, that we should construct geometric structure based on nonlinear partial differential equations. But in those days, uh, geometers do not believe that's the way to do it. And in fact, uh, I remember when I talked with uh, some really outstanding geometer like Gromo, uh, I met Gromo in, in Stony Brook, uh, he looked at dependent equations, he said, oh, these are people, uh, things that engineers would do. We geometers do not care about this kind of thing. So nonlinear equation was considered to be a subject which is geometer would not touch whatsoever. Uh, so that was the background in those days. But nonetheless, I insist that one should actually 
construct geometric structure from scratch by partial differential equation. So this was the major reason I uh, have been studying uh, constructing uh, 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 solutions to nonlinear equation in all these years. Uh, so what does that mean? That means starting from a topological space, uh, and we want to control metric over this topological space, which sets for a certain condition on this curvature, uh, because curvature should dictate the geometry. Of course, later there is some other geometry, geometric structure that we like to use. For example, affi structures or conformal structure and all that. Then it's not necessarily just curvature, but curvature is always part of it. Uh, so I was interesting immediately because the excitement on general relativity to look at the Einstein structure. So that means that we want to find a metric that solve the Einstein equation, this famous Einstein equation. But this equation is in general for space time, four dimension. Uh, but before we look at the space time in four dimension, you can ask the same question for Euclidean or Riemannian geometry. So that's what I was excited about, uh, that we should try to construct answer metric where the Tij, the meta equals zero. That's what I was interested in. And uh, well, as I said before, we need to understanding uh, we need to understand how to construct these metrics, these structures, based on nonlinear equation, because the Einstein equation is a system of nonlinear equation. And uh, this was supported by many uh, people later, and some of the people are here. And uh, and I think uh, in the last 50 years, we saw a very fruitful development uh, by many of my friends. and. Um, students and friends and all that. So, well, the first task for me was to try to understand how to do nonlinear analysis on the manifold. Well, nonlinear equation was studied by many people uh, in the 1950s, 1940s and all that, uh, especially John Nash and DeGeorge and all those people. But they are more interesting in studying equations defined on Euclidean space. And for me, I want to understand structures. So these functions uh, are defined on the manifold instead of on Euclidean space. Well, one needs to develop such a uh, uh, theory. And I felt to understand natural functions on the manifold is very important. And because the functions may determine the geometry itself, uh, this is an uh, important uh, concept, I think. And then I found out when I study uh, algebraic geometry, uh, we are interested in holomorphic functions or algebraic functions, but they are not necessarily exist uh, because they must have some singularity by maximum principle. So therefore, one starts to look at uh, session, the live or some truth functions. So this was the uh, a concept that was already created by algebraic geometers. And so I want to incorporate all these functions. So there are two classes of natural functions. One is harmonic function, and there are eigenfunctions, and there are holomorphic functions. So for me, the first task was to understand these class of functions as a building block to understand geometric structure uh, in, in eventually. A very important uh, theorem to me uh, was the Gelfand Neumann theorem, which says that the space is determined by the algebra functions. So I thought this should be similar. We like to determine geometric structures by using functions of several types. And uh, well, the harmonic function, as I said, are the most uh, primitive and important functions to understand on the manifold. So my first paper in understand geometric analysis was on harmonic functions. So there was a gradient estimate of harmonic functions on the manifold with non-negative, which character. 
this I did in 1973. And uh, this paper was the first paper I start to learn how to do estimate. And I did a gradient estimate. Uh, this paper was uh, influential for myself because then I applied it to study eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. These are the work that I did with uh, S. Y. Chen and also later with Peter Lee. Well, well, we were interested in minimum surfaces. Uh, already in Berkeley, a chair was interested in minimum surface, and several people were interested in minimum surfaces. And this, of course, include Lawson, including Lawson, including Jim Simons. At those days, we talk about it a lot. Well, minimum surface has the important property that the coordinate function uh, of Euclidean space restricting on the minimum surface are harmonic functions. So when we study harmonic functions on the minimum submanifold, it automatically tells you a great deal about the geometry of minimum surfaces. Well, when we study minimum surface in a sphere, the coordinate functions are eigenfunctions. So we see that functions of special type, harmonic or uh, eigenfunctions, automatically tells you the geometry of the manifold, the minimum submanifold, because they are coordinate functions. So naturally, I want to estimate, understand these functions, to understand the geometry behind it. Well, as I said, the first important uh, work for me was this paper on the left-hand side uh, about harmonic functions. I did a gradient estimate. Uh, I never did any estimate before. This is the first paper I did. And uh, I did not know whether it is interesting or not. Uh, uh, then I saw Louis Lindbergh in uh, Berkeley in a Stanford conference, first time I met him. I asked him whether he knew this estimate or not. He said he did not know. So I was rather pleased because then it's a, something that was not known to the great experts. So this is beginning uh, 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 analysis that I do. And then immediately afterwards, I start to work with S5 Chen on trying to understand equations on manifolds. This was in 1973 and 1974. Well, this Chen, uh, he's my old classmate. Uh, uh, we were together uh, for 60 years. And um, and then I worked with Chen. Chen was in uh, uh, Berkeley as a graduate student. And I was uh, beginning, I was a assistant professor in uh, Stanford, where I met Rick Chen, Leon Simon. I learned a lot from Leon Simon and Rick Chen already. But I have an important mission is to try to solve the Calabi conjecture. And uh, in order to relate to it, uh, Chen and I was interested in the subject of our five uh, spheres, which I will come into a little bit later. So these are the equations that you saw, you see in the left-hand side, left-hand corner, where we study Determinant uij equal the function of x and u. That's a mong pair equation. Why do we study that equation? This because this is a real analog of the complex mong pair equation. So at that time, uh, the real mong pair equation was not understood well. Uh, most of the works that was known up to that time was for two dimensions, uh, where uh, Hans Levy and Shevel and including Nienberg and Popolero uh, made, made some major breakthrough in 1950, two dimension. And then we start in the 1970s to develop high dimension version of the Mong Chen Pei equation. So Minkowski problem is one of them, which is high dimensional problem. Uh, this, uh, um, well, uh, uh, S.Y. Chen and I, solved this problem when I was visiting Kurang Institute in 1974, and when I was trying to date my wife, and spending some time there. And in the meanwhile, we solved the Minkowski problem. 
So this was a uh, interesting uh, idea that we used. And the idea went back to the estimate that I mentioned on the harmonic gradient and harmonic function. So the approach was somewhat different, independently popular of also solve the Minkowski's problem in high dimension. So this was a very important task because this is the first time we understand high dimensional mont champagne equation over real numbers. And as I said, this is a, a starting point to understand the complex mont champagne equation. Well, Peter Lee, uh, who was uh, a student of Chen, uh, when I arrived in Berkeley in 1978, uh, he, uh, he came to uh, talk with me, uh, and uh, Chen wants him to uh, to kind of guide them uh, to understand things. So Chen, that's why Chen and I decided that we should get Peter to understand eigenvalues of the Laplace. Uh, it's a subject that actually uh, uh, that Cheng and I learned by studying the books by Polia, Seiko, and some uh, many classical uh, PDE people. But we want to do it on management. So Peter and I start to apply the idea that I do in the Harvard Council gradient estimate. And then we were able to estimate eigenvalues in terms of lower bound elliptic curvature and upper bound of diameter. So we did this estimate, which I think we are still very pleased by it. It is uh, the best you can do. Upper bound and lower bound are in terms of that. Of course, um, we, at the beginning, we did not get a precise optimal constant. And the optimal constant was wrapped up by several people later. Uh, but uh, qualitatively, it is already uh, important. And then Peter Lee and I and also Chen start to work on heat kernel of Laplace on the manifold. And this turns out to be interesting. Uh, these are parabolic equations. Now is people are very used to it. Uh, but at the time when we do it, uh, majorly we are getting ideas from uh, the old proof of the Hodge. Uh, 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 freedom using heat equation due to Milgram and Rosenberg. And there we start to look at the work of um, um, John Nash. So we spent quite a uh, lot of time to understand the work of John Nash and T. Georgie, but largely uh, John Nash because he did uh, a very fundamental paper in 1958 on the heat equation. Uh, we study it, we study the paper by John S. many times. Each time we found it amazing that he has this kind of idea. And in a way, uh, we work out the detail, but we still don't understand how he arrived at those ideas. But anyway, so uh, John S. proved the HANA inequality for these powerful equations. So we learned it from him. And then I start to, Peter Lee and I start to, start to look at um, uh, what I did on harmonic functions and gradient estimate. I decide to turn it into parabolic version of it. Uh, this becomes non-trivial uh, work. It uh, wait until 19, early 1980s uh, that we accomplished that. We turn the, um, uh, Han, uh, the gradient estimate into HANA in quantity for parabolic equations. This was uh, later called Liao estimate for heat equations. So we did it for, uh, for, for this um, uh, linear equation. Uh, so when I was in San Diego in 1988, um, 89, uh, I started in 84 already. But uh, my office is um, right next door to Richard Hamilton. He came when I arrived in Berkeley, I mean, in, in San Diego. So, well, he did a great work on this In 1982, he finished the famous paper, 
the vision flow is very good, where vision curve is positive in three dimensions. And then I said, well, this is great uh, that you work so in that way, beautiful work. But then one needs to pick up the manifold by using the rigid flow. I said this would be the key to understand uh, Poincaré conjecture. So how to deal with the singularity? Uh, so I discussed with Richard Hamilton. The important thing is to control the uh, flow when the curvature is reasonable positive. So I told Richard about this uh, uh, estimate that I did repeatedly, and I said this should be important. Uh, well, Hamid seems to believe me without any question, and he, little do I don't know that he acted well on it in a very uh, substantial manner. And that it takes about three years, I think, before he actually come up with the right uh, inequality and all that. This inequality, uh, when Richard showed it to me, I was totally amazed that he was able to achieve it. Of course, uh, once you know the inequality, it takes probably two pages to write down the answer. But the fact uh, that you can come up with the right form and also prove it is totally not trivial. It's really a creative work that Richard Hamilton do. And this becomes a fundamental idea for the first uh, one third papers of Perelman, which people seem to ignore. Uh, this becomes a basic proof for the study of the Richard flow, and it was applied by Perelman in the Poincaré conjecture. And in fact, if you look at the, the inequality carefully, the one developed by uh, Richard Hamilton, the concept of entropy that Perelman had and all this follows almost immediately, at least the first uh, one third of the paper. And uh, many people ignore the, this contribution of uh, Richard. I think it's too bad. Anyway, so this is the one important part of my uh, uh, motivation to do geometric analysis uh, from the part that I tried to do chaotic conjecture and relating to understand eigenfunctions and relating to understand motion pair equation and the middle surface from the point of view. And I think this has been great. But then, of course, I had a great conversation with Leon Simon and Rick Sher, who has been the key for me to understand further about geometric analysis. And uh, uh, is this a, Rick, is this your picture? Yeah, yeah. it seems to be different. <laughs> anyway, so Rick and I uh, work on video surveys. That's one of the very important paper, the first paper we wrote on the stability of minimal hypersurface. And I think uh, many important works later developed based on that paper. And the idea come from there has been extremely important. And then Rick and I actually try to understand minimal surfaces in general manifold, especially three dimensional manifold. At the same time, we found out Ken Wolbeck with Sachs was working on the sphere freedom. And uh, I think Rick and I try to prove the sphere freedom because we look at the high genius sphere minimal surfaces. And then I was thinking maybe this should work for minimal S2 also. But then we saw in the announcement by Ken Wilder and Sachs, who has done the thing that we try to do. And at the beginning, I did not quite believe Karen could do it. Because when I met Karen Wilder, uh, it was in 1969 in Berkeley, she was a postdoc. And at that point, she seemed to know very little about nonlinear PDE. So, so I thought uh, with that knowledge, she probably would not be able to do this job. But then in 1974 in and 75, I go through her paper carefully. I think this is really an important paper uh, in geometric analysis. Uh, many creative ideas were there. And, and so I really admire her work. And um, 
we we start to know each other much better. So South Schoolbet well has inspired me and tremendously. And this has been important for my work later with few weeks about constructing minimal uh, sphere and all that. But in the meanwhile, what Blake and I do for constructing minimal surface in comparison with minimal surface lead to the understanding of manifolds with positive scalar curvature. Anyway, this is something uh, goes back all the way to Plateau, of course, and in the last century was due to J.C. Douglas and Rago. This was in the early 20th century where Douglas got the fuse metal, uh, first fuse metal, in fact. And then, of course, my teacher, Molly, made a big, important contribution to minimal surfaces in generally many, many more, which inspired the work of such Wollenberg. And there was an important problem uh, left by, uh, by Molly. He only proved that there exists a bench cover uh, immersion of minimal surfaces. And then Sachs and, and then Bob Oxerman proved uh, that the bench cover, the singularity that appears, is uh, not so bad. And so it's immersed. Uh, minimal surface is a bench uh, uh, cover. Uh, this is an interesting story because Kula thought that the, uh, it cannot be immersed. And Oxman found a reason why it has to be. So Wally Solson then becomes an immersed uh, uh, surface for the map. Then there's left over a very important question whether the map is actually embedded. And this takes a uh, mix and myself uh, to work out. So if the Jordan curve is on the convex body, on the boundary convex body, we demonstrate that the interior is embedded. This actually is, I think, is a very important uh, fact. And in fact, uh, my friend Ian Simon uh, was um, uh, say that is a important well, and he wants to do it, uh, avoiding the topological argument that we use. So Mix and I start to use uh, topology argument from three manifold, namely the argument things lemma to prove this uh, old conjecture that for extreme curve the minimal surface is bounds and embed. And this was good. And I, we did this well when Mix was visiting UCLA, when I was also visiting UCLA in 1976. And, um, well, we were young, and we turned the, the argument around, namely, uh, we used topology to solve a geometric problem, then we used geometry to solve the topological problem. Namely, we solved something called equivalent things lemma. So things lemma is purely topological lemma. We use it to prove that minimal surface is bad. Now we turn it around because geometry is more rigid. Then we see that the symmetry must fix it. So Mix and I uh, settled the equivalent uh, things lemma using geometry. This uh, coupled with the work of Burston and also some some observation of Gordon was able to solve the famous Smith conjecture, which says that group action on the sphere are basically linear, contribute to some linear effort. So this was actually an old problem in topology, which based on this work that we did, and also Burston's work and others. Uh, we saw it. But now, of course, people forgot it because now uh, you can use uh, the argument due to Preston, uh, geometrization, or the rigid flow to do it, but that's much more complicated argument. Anyway, so Mix, uh, Leon Summer, and I also uh, proposed the minimal service embeddedness further, where we can settle some part of the quantum conjecture. 
uh, uh, but it's not enough to prove the key point of the conjecture. Uh, but it's said to half of it. Uh, anyway, uh, Preston was my classmate in uh, Berkeley, and he's really creative, and I learned a lot from him, um, especially uh, uh, when he started to do the tumultization problem. Anyway, as I said, the Smith conjecture uh, was a well-known problem, and then it was uh, solved by combination of Preston's well and Gordon's well with uh, Mix and myself. So that this was good. Uh, well, the minimum surface argument then is now proved by Blake and I in 1978. Uh, during, I still remember, during a walk on the campus of Berkeley, we suddenly got the right idea to see that um, a asymptotic flat, uh, actually we do a special case first, basically, we proved that phi dominant toroid cannot have a metric with forces scalar curvature. And this, we use minimal surface to prove. And then we generate this argument to prove that uh, uh, positive mass conjecture also works in the critical case. And this was very important, I think, starting from minimal surface argument. Um, so at the beginning, when we solved this problem, uh, at least the important case, uh, most relativities do not believe that we have done yet. Including some of my close friends, they just said that uh, you guys know nothing about physics. How, how on earth you can solve this important question? Uh, it's an in interesting thing is that before we solved the positive mass conjecture, there are uh, meetings in general relativity uh, each two years, they have a big meeting. And each two years, they have a special topic just to see how to prove the positive mass conjecture. So they could not quite, quite deny that is an important, uh, important uh, uh, achievement in, in general relativity. So when we proved it, uh, they were not too happy. Uh, in any case, uh, it turns out Stephen Hawking said that it's fine to prove. So this is very important that Stephen Hawking was willing to say it. And I went to uh, Cambridge uh, in 1978 after I gave the talk in the Congress of, in Helsinki. And Stephen Hawking talked with me for the whole day uh, about this work and also high dimension version, which she called uh, positive action conjecture. And this, uh, after talk of him, I come back to Berkeley and I saw that we rigged. Uh, so that was pretty good. And then we start to work with high dimension, uh, the positive mass conjecture. And this uh, involved dimension reduction arguments. And I think this is a very nice statement that we can do. Okay. So the minimum service argument, you understand topology becomes very useful. It, it becomes a fundamental thing to study topology variable in positive scalar curvature. And this, uh, of course, uh, led to the classification of them, uh, at least for compact manifold with positive scalar curvature. Uh, the classification, assuming the point kind conjecture is true, then there's a complete classification. So I think we wrote the paper in the physics review, review letter. Uh, we were the first one who cast by such manifold, assuming quantum conjecture is true. And um, well, immediately around the same time, and right after we are working on this, uh, Rick and I start to do this geometric surgery, which allows us to, us to study the topology of land manifolds in terms of, of cutting the manifolds to the surgery and so when you start out with a metric with positive scalar curvature, after surgery, you still emit a metric with positive scalar curvature. This tensor was observed by Global and Lawson that this is equivalent to uh, spin quadrature uh, statement, which was well known to people in homotopic physics. 
So the fact that we were able to do surgery, I think is very important. And they observed that yes, equivalent to spin cobalism. Once you get into that, I think the uh, general argument from homotopy allows you to classify such manifold at least when you simply got that. That was done by Stokes. Well, in order to understand the formulas of a black hole, uh, uh, we, in the meanwhile, uh, understand the Jan equation, which was just discussed by Rick a, a, an hour ago. Uh, well, I think an important side effect for us is to demonstrate the existence of a black hole when the matter density is large enough. And this is very uh, interesting to me. I have to be uh, felt that rather exciting when we proved this statement. And Rick was in Stanford, or in Berkeley. I was in Princeton at that time. And uh, I think that the more I look at it, the more I think it is a very uh, good film. Uh, because we just assume matter density is large. We do not need to know the state of matter, which turns out all physicists make that assumption. They make assumption on the scalar field or make assumption on uh, the fluids which satisfies, uh, uh, you know, a P and rho, the, the, the relation between them, but we really actually makes no assumption. And this is, in general, a um, very powerful statement, I feel. But unfortunately, this statement is usually taken for granted by news media, by all these physicists, when they told the general public what should be true, and they thought it was obvious. But actually, uh, as far as I can tell, when I arrived in, in uh, Clinton, the astronomers never believed that coal would exist until the 1980s, the late 80s. And, uh, so the mass media likes black hole because sun food. And they never uh, seem to know uh, the black hole exists, it's just uh, assumed to be true because sun food. Uh, they could not derive it from general, the fundamental principle of general relativity. And this work that I did with Ray, I think, is really from the fundamental principle of general relativity. First time we proved the existence of black hole due to a very general assumption, namely when the matter density is large, the black hole will fall. Then, of course, there are other mechanisms to make black hole to fall, uh, but this is the, the most general statement that we make. And actually, I, I gave a seminar on this in IAS, and there was Andy Schrominger, Crystal Duro, Gary Horace. They are all stopped at that time. And actually, Crystal Duro was staying in my apartment for a few months. And he was very excited by, uh, by this statement that uh, Rick and I do. He told me his PhD advisor, John Miller, asked him to work on this problem. So only after almost 30 years, he managed to finish a beautiful paper, I think about 10 years ago, that gravity wave collision makes the black hole. Uh, he makes some uh, very skillful constructor to do it, but only well out in some cases, but not similar to the general uh, statement that we make up there. Uh, well, of course, the recent discovery of gravitational radiation uh, makes it clear that black hole exists, and they even give the web prize to several people. And the last one was given to Roger Pendles. The newspaper said that he was the one who proved the existence of black hole. But in fact, he did not quite do it. Uh, but he introduced a very, very ingenious uh, statement. Uh, namely, he introduced the fundamental concept of a closed cup surface, uh, which of course was discussed by Ray. Uh, on the wall uh, that you were talking about. So closed cup surface, uh, those surfaces where light has to bend back. But she made the assumption such a thing exists, and then she demonstrates singularity must occur. 
That's why people start to be excited by the culture service. But on the other hand, he did not, uh, he was not able to find a physical, reasonable condition to demonstrate that culture vaccine. So this was proved by Rick and I. And so basically, we proved this statement that given a space omega with radius uh, omega, and then if the matter density is bigger than this quantity, then omega contains a black hole. Uh, this is, uh, I said, after 40, 30 years, I still found that a beautiful statement. And uh, the constant is close to this best constant. So after the neutron star, and uh, basically it says that uh, the, it has to correct the black hole. So this is a rather nice statement. And uh, well, uh, well, as I said, we have been working together with Rick for a long, long time, uh, all the way for 15 years until uh, uh, Rick stayed in California, I went to Harvard, and uh, we're still, of course, close fund heavily. And this is a picture that we took when I was uh, 59 years old in Harvard. And uh, many of good friends come. Uh, well, with many of our friends, uh, Rick, Ian Simon, Hamilton, Ken Winberg, Cliff Towns, and all this, we really start the modern era of the winter analysis. And uh, uh, collectively, we have a book called Seminars on Dependent Geometry, published in 1983. But the, the book, I mean, the seminars were in 1979 from 1980. So most of us were there. We study this subject. And this subject now has become a big key with many branches. And many major problems are solved. Uh, well, uh, so uh, I really still remember the good old days of Rick and I uh, still uh, young. And we wrote about this paper on the positive mass conjecture. It was in the summer of 1979 in Palo Alto. Uh, his girlfriend at that time lives in a, has a good friend who owns a grand house in Los Alto. The house was beautiful with a swimming pool. And in the daytime, we were hot on the, uh, on the positive mass conjecture. And after dinner, we swim in the swimming pool. It's a really ideal research life that, that we do. The whole summer we were we were in Colorado, uh, I mean in Stanford doing that. Uh, well, as, as I said, afterwards, uh, uh, she 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 was in Stanford. And I was in uh, uh, Harvard. But anyway, at Harvard, I was influenced by many of my colleagues in the physics department. This including Andy Stromacher and also uh, Kumran Rafa. And we uh, start to spend more time in questions related to string theory and algebraic geometry. And, uh, and in fact, the physicists offer me to be a faculty in the department about 15 years ago. And this is rather interesting because you see how physicists work. And it's quite different from how we have to do the uh, I think after, uh, in the history of uh, Harvard, I was the first one who was, who had always drawn a problem in both physics and math. Uh, well, physicists always want to leap forward simply because they want to reach some goal uh, first, whether far, whether they are right or wrong. Uh, but uh, they do provide really a large uh, uh, amount of information, intuition that led to important development in math. On the other hand, they never really prove their claim uh, uh, to the level that is acceptable to a math to mathematicians. Uh, this is especially true for ideas that come from quantum field theory. So it becomes a very complementary uh, uh, help uh, to each other. Physics provides intuition 
that we can go forward and we provide a proof that makes uh, the proof make the intuition to be sound. Without mathematical proof, I think most of these claims probably are very dubious. Anyway, uh, it's always amazed to me that uh, once they translate to mathematics, physics idea, it becomes very useful and can translate into ideas that solve some important problems that has been open in uh, mathematics for a long time. So I've been spending a lot of time to work with Schrodinger, to work with Walter, to work with Witten, and many of these people. But how do I get into this whole thing with the immediately? We start off from the carbon conjecture, which I consider in the old days when I was a graduate student, I started to look at it. And this comes from the fact that I want to construct a space time which is relative and yet non trivial. Um, well, this is an equation uh, to handle the important case when the space is actually Taylor. So this was uh, proposed by Carby in 1954. But actually, very few people know that in the first paper by Taylor, who invented Taylor geometry, he more or less know this statement. Uh, he wrote down what uh, which character is. He wrote down the Taylor Einstein equation uh, already in really the paper of Taylor. Uh, uh, and in fact, he also defined the Vichy tensor to be the first train class. He knew he is a topological invariant already. So, 1933 paper, I suggest you guys take a look at that paper. Anyway, the proof of carbon conjecture led to the proof of many important results in algebraic geometry that have been open for many years. So, the proof of carbon conjecture led me to an immediate faith because people pay more attention to algebraic geometry in those days. And uh, this was a paper that I wrote in 1976. Why well, come out in 1977? Uh, that was uh, the time when I just got married. And uh, I always feel very good. Uh, uh, when I see my wife, I always find some good deal. So this is the first time I, I did my first major work. That, uh, that that's two weeks after I got married. Anyway, the carbon conjecture uh, was uh, important, as I said, we apply it to algebraic geometry, but then I immediately realized it to, to be applied to algebraic geometry in a substantial way. We have to understand the singular manifold. Singular manifold appears naturally in algebraic geometry, so the metric has to be adapted to singularity and all that. And both the non compact and singular manifolds should be understood. So in 1978, I gave a talk in Helsinki, uh, the Congress talk, attended the talk actually. I announced uh, some of the statements that I knew and, I, and also what I supposed to, to know or supposed to be true. So this corresponding to the algebraic manifold take away a one non singular hypersurface divisor. I knew pretty much what to do for that. And based on that, I make some conjectures. Well, of course, I knew the conjecture may not be 100% true, but, <clears throat> but I, I was sure that it's basically correct in the right direction. And so, <clears throat> so I kind of proposed an outline of what to do for general uh, procedures. So, Try to construct this manifold. Well, it's not trivial uh, because uh, one has to construct answers for singular manifold or non compare manifold. Namely, to construct an asymptotic solution of this matrix, assuming only questions of geometry. Uh, this was interesting, but it's not so easy. 
even now, the problems that we still could not solve, how to construct answers for good uh, great geometric background. Anyway, I knew a lot of physicists after this, and I actually asked Andy Schumacher and uh, Horowitz about the Karatu conjecture. I said, well, I construct many vacuums, so I said, are they useful? Uh, they said, absolutely nonsense, no use, because Einstein's general relativity based on Lorentzian metric. You construct, you put a metric, no good. Well, anyway, uh, uh, I still believe that uh, it's good, no matter what. So I still study it. Uh, it turns out even the Hawking has just developed uh, a, a theory of how you put a graph. And they use the so-called weight rotation to apply such metrics. Uh, I should say that before I saw the Darby conjecture, there's practically no example of uh, rich effect metrics, uh, which is compact or even non-compact. Uh, all of them are coming out from homogeneous group action. So after I found this metric, then many people start to work on it. And the very remarkable group is Stevens and Hawking. And Carly also built an answer to give explicit solutions. Uh, this is called Carly uh, answers, and they are very useful. But all of these examples are not compact. Uh, they have not provided a single example which is compact. But they are very useful for many things. Um, and, uh, well, uh, so as I said, when I was in Princeton in 1980, uh, I was a faculty there. There are physicists who I'm very familiar with, uh, mostly from the point of view of general relativity. So there are Andy Strominger, Horowitz, and Malcolm Perry. Uh, they were all students of uh, Horowitz and Malcolm Perry were a student of Hawking. And he come from Harvard, oh, well, from MIT at that point. Uh, well, Gary was my assistant, actually, uh, uh, working as my assistant. All these are big, big stars nowadays. Strominger and Horowitz are now uh, academicians in the American National Academy. So Gary was my assistant. She told me this great guy, Andy, really knows supergravity, and I should talk to him. So I learned a lot of things about supersymmetry from Jim. So I have been out with them quite often. So as I said, they, they were thinking, I asked them about this cloudy conjecture, whether they're useful for physics. They said it's absolutely useless. But then, interesting enough, um, I, after a few months, a few years, uh, they called me up. Uh, that was in 1984. Um, they called me in uh, 1984 when the first string levels had come up. So Andy Schumacher was looking for me everywhere under the sun. Uh, Miss Underwood was my secretary at the time in Princeton. And then uh, she told him that I was visiting my wife in San Diego. And uh, she didn't know who they are. She said these two young fellows were looking at you everywhere. So then I finally got contact with Andy. I called him up. He told me she's anxious to know what I told him in 1981 is true or not. Namely, to construct those uh, uh, Taylor manifold with rigid fat metric. So Kaylin and to them is equivalent to supersymmetric sources. So that means you can find supersymmetric solutions, which is vacuum. And this is what we need for a vacuum solution for string field. Uh, so I confirm that this is exactly what I told him. He was really excited. Then I got uh, phone calls from Gary Horowitz and also Witten. Uh, it's interesting. When Witten called me, he decided, when I described to him uh, what I know about it, uh, the Krabi of Manifold, he is very interested in how many are there. 
And at that point, uh, to my recollection, there are only three uh, that I know of that I was used to. And uh, he was very excited. He said, well, there are three. That means we know the universe. And uh, so he applied to me, tried to San Diego the next day. He was very efficient. He arrived in early morning, and we started to talk for the whole day. Then by, but, but before he came, I start to construct many more. And I knew there was quite a bit more than what I know of. So he started to uh, explain to me what is important uh, about um, cardio, young medical. Uh, he felt it's a very fundamental for physics. And he's, he wanted me to keep on working on it. He's, when he left the Lego, he told me, this like good old days when quantum mechanics was discovered. Any contribution can be memorized in the field. Well, whether it's true or not, I was excited about it in any case. And um, it takes still much longer time, I guess, to understand them. In any case, they, the four of them published this groundbreaking paper, creating a beautiful model, vector model for string theory. There are many models for string theory. But I think at the end, I think Carbio Melbourne is still the most elegant and beautiful one. And uh, there are non Taylor models nowadays, which I actually work on it myself. But at the end, I still feel Carbio Melbourne is still the best. Uh, in fact, when I had a, um, a 70th birthday conference for Carby many years ago, about 30 years ago, uh, Carby was there. I was joking to tell him that Carby Melbourne is now so popular. He's, uh, I feel that Carby is my first name. He was very happy to know that. Anyway, this is a beautiful model and has appeared in number theory, the algebra geometry, in many different places. Any um, interesting, important, Contribution to it are really interesting uh, from the point of view of geometry, and I hope it will lead to some major development in physics, which we are not sure. But anyway, we are interested enough. Uh, especially um, uh, a conjecture I made in the 1990s uh, or 1980s, I think is that there are only a finite number of topology of such six times the manifold. And uh, although there are more than 10,000 of them that was known now, but uh, there are still a uh, finite number. So a very important uh, uh, question is whether there are only a finite number of topology of types. And this is still an important question that a big geometer could not answer. But it's an interesting question that I I, I think it still needs to be answered. Uh, many people, uh, physicists input, uh, seem to um, ignore the statement, if we want the oil number of this manifold to be equal to plus or minus six. Why six? Uh, because the number of fermions is supposed to be three fermions. If we assume that is the case, then the oil number should be plus or minus six. And this class of manifold, cardio manifold, with the oil number equal to plus or minus six, is very small number that we know of. So you know, I think it's interesting to look into that, even from the point of view of a geometer, algebra geometer. How many topologies are there uh, for an uh, oil number equal to plus or minus six? For a copy of manifold. Uh, this was not studied by people, uh, but still, I found it fascinating that uh, similar to the old days when the Catonian uh, saw it, there are only five of them. And uh, this would be interesting to know uh, whether the copy of manifold has only a few of them as oil number equal to plus or minus six. But anyway, uh, at the time, when I finished my work with Ken Woodback on the existence of uh, the Mr. Young's condition, then um, 
uh, Tristan just talked about. I, I, this was part when the string theory uh, uh, revolution started in 1984. And I told everything this should be important for string theory because it produced a natural defined young new solutions and it, it has supersymmetry. I said this has to be useful. <laughs> but he told me the answer is no again. Uh, but after one year, he wrote a very influential paper saying that these bundles are important in heterogeneous string theory. And these bundles are actually important in cryptography also. So I actually consider this paper that I wrote with Carol in there is one of my best paper and very interesting paper because this is a uh, system of nonlinear equation and yet we can prove based on stability that existence is guaranteed non-singular solution. And this is also a theory uh, of constructing geometric, nonlinear geometric solution based on the concept of stability. And this is really starting uh, uh, for me to feel that most of the geometric nonlinear equation are related to some concept of stability. And this finally appears in one of the conjectures I make on uh, scalar curvature, uh, uh, K-lines are metric on final manifolds. So this turns out to be good. Uh, so nonlinear analysis in algebraic geometry turns out to be a major uh, tool uh, because the Hermitian uh theory uh, developed into something called Higgs field, which was introduced by Hitchin. And with the Higgs field, uh, which was introduced, uh, you know, in high dimension generalization, was due to Simpson, Carl Simpson. And this becomes a fundamental tool in the algebraic geometry. Uh, but the basic uh, idea actually come from Sachs and Kamruenberg and myself, uh, where we prove if the train class is equal to zero, then the extremal case gives rise to a projective flat structure. Nowadays, people just assume that it's obvious, but it actually has to go through my work with Kamruenberg, which was generalized by uh, Simpson to the Higgs situation. And this is very important, I think. And uh, the power of this well actually cannot be reached by traditional method of algebraic geometry. Algebraic geometry just makes an assumption without uh, 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 knowing that it takes a lot of analysis to prove it. And uh, this is shows the power of geometric analysis and the nonlinear partial dependent equation which is transcendental and based on infinite dimensional manifolds. Uh, so these are important, I think. The projective flat algebraic bundles are very important. Anyway, uh, so as I said, there are several uh, important fields in algebraic geometry can only still can only be proved by the work of k lines symmetric or Hermitian young wheels. And I think the reason is that Algebraic methods have difficulty to handle algebraic methods with infinite fundamental group, something that is truly transcendental. Anyway, so as I said, Hitchin and Klaus, uh, Carl Simpson has made very important uh, contribution to generalize Hermes and Young Mills to the Higgs uh, situation because they become very effective in understanding quadrant space of uh, bundles and all that. Uh, and this becomes a very powerful tool, uh, in, even in number fields. Uh, so anyway, at the same time, uh, string theory has developed there's something called mirror symmetry. And this mirror symmetry starts around late 1980s. Uh, several physicists uh, talk about it, and several important people around Harvard was Brian Green, who was my postdoc at the time, and Ron Presser, who was student of Kuhlman Rafa. So they developed a mirror symmetry concept in Harvard. At the same time, uh, Kenderas and his group developed 
uh, the, the similar thing in Texas. And together, this becomes a very, very important uh, tools in understanding cardiac menopause uh, by using the symmetry, the mirror symmetry. This has been going on for many years by now. Uh, it has been used to settle some important questions in immune geometry, where we use to count resonant curves and hygienous curves, uh, which was studied by algebraic geometry for more than 100 years ago, and only solvable by using this method of mirror symmetry. And this becomes a very dramatic uh, achievement to me, and I start to look at it with many uh, of my postdocs and my students. And uh, so uh, Bonnell was my postdoc at the time, and Posano uh, was my postdoc, and so is uh, Krem. And so we start to understand all this. <laughs> Interesting enough, uh, when Colin Martha uh, asked me uh, this new cohorty uh, by using the, uh, the concept of conformal field theory, what should we call it? I said, let's call it quantum cohorty. And now it has been there uh, ever since, which is an interesting uh, story. Anyway, uh, this was almost uh, um, 40 years since this development. And I believe many of the important contributions have been made by mathematicians to prove those formula that was inspired by string theory, which makes them uh, that we have more confidence in the idea of mirror symmetry, which means some basic symmetry in string theory, uh, although cannot be uh, tested by experiment, it can be tested by mathematics. Uh, which is, I think, is very interesting. Uh, maybe finally, let me mention uh, an important uh, 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 experience that I had. There was a second uh, string level, and uh, in string theory, and the brain theory were playing an important role, and Edmonton started and M theory, and Pochinski and all these people start the brain theory and all that. And I was invited to go to a conference in ICTP in Chiaz in Italy. This was in 1984, 85, I forgot now. Uh, 1994. And I went there, uh, looked quite stupid because I know nothing about brain theory and all that. And I thought, uh, I'm just learning. Then Edmonton was there. He, he told me that there's a sp special class of brain uh, introduced by Becker, Becker, and Stronger. So these two uh, sisters, actually, they were postdocs of Andy Stronger. Stronger is a good friend of mine, but she was not in Harvard at this moment. So they said, well, Edmonton said that there's such a super symmetric place proposed by Becker, Becker, and Stronger. They asked me what I think, whether it's natural or not. But look at it, I found out it's very natural because it creates minimal surfaces and all that. At that point, I forgot uh, this was actually uh, the idea was, mathematical idea was introduced already by Lawson and Harvey uh, a few years before. They called such objects to be special Lagrangian cycles. But at that point, Becker, Becker, and Schumacher called it supersymmetric cycles. And, uh, but anyway, I, I, at the beginning, I look at the supersymmetric cycles. I told Ed Witten, I said, this looks very good, should be interesting. And then, uh, this is the first time uh, these kind of optics are not defined by holomorphic optics, holomorphic function and all that. So this takes some special effort to understand. But then, uh, and then I start to look at this in terms of mirror symmetry. So this is the first thing I come back after I come back from uh, Piaz, I talked with Eric Sasso, who was my postdoc at that time. So I try to understand a special class of this plane, special Lagrangian, uh, which will be mirror symmetric to a point. Uh, and this is interesting. A point moves in the metaphor, and the free cycle is special Lagrangian polar, turns out to be. 
and they move around a meter to each other. And so this is very exciting to me because the point moves, the module I say the point is the manifold, Carbio manifold itself. The other guy is moving out, forming, filling out the meter of three manifolds. And so after discussion with this, we start to work out uh, some more detail. And the edge structure come to visit uh, Harvard, uh, looking for a job basically in Harvard. And we come together and look at more about the background in physics. And uh, looking at that, we construct what we nowadays call SYC construction, SYC program. There are quite a few uh, people who are surrounding, uh, visiting us, and this including Mark Rose and Richard Thomas, and they, they start to be excited about this whole program. And uh, also Conan Lev, who was my student, uh, he, he finished his PhD already. He come from Hong Kong. So all of them are influenced by this program, and they start to look uh, well on this, and a very fruitful influence, I think all of them has produced first class work in this subject, based on the SYC construction. So this has led to many fruitful uh, um, results, although it's still a conjecture, but both of them has worked out to be nicely. And uh, so we are interested in the modular space of this. Uh, so uh, anyway, I, I feel this is a very exciting period. At the same time, uh, Konservic and Fukaya have proposed a different approach to meter symmetry. They use something called derived geometry and Fukaya category, which is uh, probably very geometric to them, not so much geometric to me. I like the geometry of special Ragonia much better. But they are developing side by side and influence each other. And I think this is a very fruitful and interesting period. As I said, Rose and Siebert proposed a grand algebraic metric program to understand the SYC construction. And, and Gross and uh, Conan uh, also work on these things. Then, as I said, immediately afterwards, uh, Hosano, Bonner, and I study uh, the meter symmetry formula, and this becomes very useful and important. And, uh, and then, uh, a few years later, Yamakuchi was my postdoc in Kami, and we formulated some formulas uh, to understand the famous work of BCOV, uh, which is still mysterious to me. But this turns out the formulation does lead to something interesting. And I think some of them was already cool by Juni and his co-worker. Uh, so there are quite a few other things which I don't think I have time to go into, and it's getting late. So let me stop here.